I hope when you see this crowd today, this is what you had in mind when you talked about the political revolution. Ladies and gentlemen, the great senator from Vermont, Senator Bernie Sanders. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out. And Mike, this is exactly what I did mean when I talked about the political revolution. Here is a simple truth, brothers and sisters. And the simple truth is that throughout the history of our country and throughout the history of the world, you all know this, Real change, fundamental change, has never taken place when a president signs a bill or somebody on top makes a decision. It has always taken place as a result of grassroots activism. And when millions of people have looked around them and said, you know what, the status quo is not satisfactory. We need to move in a new direction. You think back now. Think back 100, 150 years ago of children working in factories here in Massachusetts, Vermont, New Hampshire, of little kids out on the fields, of working people who had no rights. And against all of the odds, without any money, often without any edu education, people stood up and said, it ain't right that a boss can fire somebody for any reason whatsoever, that people are working seven days a week and they're not making any money, we need to form a union. And at the grassroots level, millions of people came together and they went out on strike and they were beaten, occasionally killed, to say that working people in America must have dignity, the right to form a union, the right to negotiate collective bargaining. And then without going to great length because we all know the horrors of what slavery and racism and segregation was about in this country. Think back again, 100, 200 years ago, people alone looking around them and saying slavery is not right, racism is not right. God did not create different races to be treated differently. We are all human beings. And think about those people. Think about those people who were lynched, who were jailed, who were beaten. We don't know most of those names and the courage, the courage that they showed to say that in America we will defeat racism and we will become a common humanity. And you think about women and the struggles of the women's movement in this country. And people forget about it. The children really don't know anything about this. That 100 years ago today, women did not have the right to vote. Forget about running for president or the Senate. They didn't have the right to vote. Had a divorce. They had no property rights. Treated as third-class citizens. But women and their male allies said, sorry, that is not what the dream of this country is supposed to be about. We're going to stand up and we're going to fight back. And they did. And think about, think about how, for so long, so long, our gay brothers and sisters had to hide their sexual orientation and all that that meant until some incredibly brave people said, yeah, I'm gay and I'm not ashamed about it. And all of the humiliation and brutality that the gay community experienced, and think about some decades ago, when people looked out and said, something is going on with the environment. We cannot continue to destroy the environment without paying a profound price. And people said, you're crazy. This is progress. More and more 
pollution, that's progress. And they said, no, it's not. And they became the leaders of the international environmental movement. So what's the point? The point is that we live in a nation today where not only do we have massive levels of income and wealth inequality, horrific levels, where the top one-tenth of one percent today owns almost as much wealth as the bottom 90 percent. And that's a disgrace unto itself that we have to address. But that translates itself then into the political system, where as a result of this disastrous Citizens United Supreme Court decision, billionaires are now increasingly controlling the political process in America and undermining what American democracy is supposed to be about. <laughs> on Thursday, I left Washington after a vote on the Republican budget. And I want you to understand what is in this budget. What's in this budget is $1.9 trillion in tax breaks, 80% of them going to the top 1%. 40% of them going to the top one-tenth of 1%. One and then, insanely, in order to pay for those tax breaks, they propose a trillion dollars in cuts in Medicaid, throwing 15 million people off of the health insurance they have, that is beyond terrible. What that means, let's be clear, let us be clear. I don't mean to be overly dramatic here. You think about it, no, 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 listen, listen, listen. You throw 15 million people off of health insurance, some of whom are dealing with cancer, some who are dealing with heart disease, some who are dealing with diabetes, some who are dealing with all kinds of life-threatening illnesses. This is not Bernie Sanders talking, there's a number of scientific studies out there. You do that. Thousands, many thousands of people will die unnecessarily every single year in order to give tax breaks to billionaires. Now, the reason I raise this issue about tax breaks for billionaires and cuts not only to Medicaid and Medicare, but to Pell Grants, to the WIC program, to environmental programs. Now, how does somebody come up with the idea that when the middle class and working class of this country are struggling, that we are going to remove the programs or cut the programs they desperately need in order to give tax breaks to the billionaires. Who decided that? And the answer is that you have groups like the Koch brothers and other multi-billionaire families who will spend hundreds of millions of dollars in this election cycle, hundreds of millions of dollars telling the Republicans that we, who are only worth, in the case of the Copras, we're only worth $90 billion. How do you think we're going to get by? <laughs> hey, it's tough out there, you know. Price of housing, my God, $90 billion. How's our family going to make it? And what they want is the repeal of the estate tax. You all know what that is? That is a tax that impacts the top two-tenths of 1%. So the point is that what you are seeing crystally clear in the tax debate is the majority party not doing what the American people want because poll after poll after poll says the American people do not want tax breaks for billionaires. Quite the contrary, they want the rich to stop paying their fair share. What you are looking at, as somebody here just mentioned, is the evolution of this country into an oligarchic form of society where public policy is determined not by and for the people, but by and for the oligarchs. And what today is about, and what today is about, and this is pretty profound and important, what today is about is saying that at the local level, at the state level, at the federal level, we are going to demand and will succeed in creating governments that work for all of us, not just the 
Now, Mike Conley, Mike Conley made this point. What Mike said is that, you know, we do badly, frankly, compared to other countries in terms of our voter turnout, even at national levels. We do very bad presidential elections. We do horrifically, embarrassingly bad at midterm elections when the Republicans swept the House and the Senate in 2014 nationally, almost two-thirds of the American people didn't vote. Okay, And that is also true at local elections. In Vermont and all over this country, people do not come out. What the political revolution is about is saying that if we are going to be successful in taking on the billionaire class whose greed is destroying this country, we need a mass movement of people at the grassroots level who are going to stand up and fight back, and that means getting involved, which is what you are doing and what those candidates are doing at the local level. And I'm delighted, delighted to see the progress we are making, that our revolution is making, all over this country, because the point that Mike made is that during my campaign, I tried over and over again to say it's not about one person. It is about a mass movement of people, people standing up all over this country. And we are seeing it here in Somerville, we're seeing it in Cambridge, and frankly, we're seeing it all over the United States. Just last month, and I want you to know this, because I know the political landscape sometimes can look depressing, but I want you to know that just last month in Birmingham, Alabama, Birmingham, Alabama, people there led by Randall Woodfin, young African-American attorney, put together a strong grassroots movement. They beat the incumbent by a landslide. Wasn't even close. So brothers and sisters in Birmingham, Alabama, and in Jackson, Mississippi, yes, you got it right, Mississippi, young man named Choi Lumumba became mayor of the capital city of Mississippi, also in a grassroots level. Because of your efforts, Paul Feeney was just elected to the state senate. And we are seeing that kind of result literally all over this country. Working people, young people, running for school board, running for city council, running for state legislature, and they are winning. So it seems to me that in this moment, this pivotal moment, in American history, we have two jobs in front of us, both equally important. Number one, our job in the deepest, most profound way is to tell Mr. Trump that he will not be successful in dividing this country up based on our religion, based on our sexual orientation or the color of our skin or the country that we were born in. He wants to divide us up. Our job is to bring our people together to fight racism and sexism and homophobia and xenophobia. But simultaneously, as we fight back against that effort to divide us up, we need a progressive agenda that speaks to the needs of working families all across this country to say that if you love your children and you're concerned about your parents, you have got to get involved in the political process. And that agenda, among many other 
points. That agenda says that at a time of massive income and wealth inequality, when the middle class is shrinking, when we have 40 million people living in poverty, when the rich are becoming phenomenally richer, no, we are not going to give huge tax breaks to the people on top. They're going to start paying their fair share of taxes. And a progressive agenda, a progressive agenda states that too many people in this country have fought and died to defend American democracy, and we're not going to let the Koch brothers and a handful of billionaires control our political system. We believe in one person, one vote, not billionaires buying elections. And that means overturning Citizens United and moving to public funding of elections. And a progressive agenda says to the folks in Massachusetts and in Vermont and all across this country who are trying to get by on 10, 11 bucks an hour, our message to them is we understand that if you work 40 hours a week in the United States of America, you shouldn't be living in poverty, you shouldn't have to go to an emergency food shelf to get the food to feed your family. We're going to raise the minimum wage to a living wage, 15 bucks an hour. And when we talk about wages, we're going to end the absurdity of women today making 80 cents on the dollar compared to men. Pay equity for women. Now, all of you know, as a result of very strong grassroots activism, we were able to defeat in the Senate, not once, but on five occasions, the Republican effort to repeal and or replace the Affordable Care Act. And that was because millions, literally, all over this country, people coming out to rallies, to town meetings, sending emails, calling up members of the Senate. But the status quo with regard to health care is not good enough. So our view is, no, we're not going to throw 15 or 30 million people off of health care. We're going to do what every other major country on earth does, guarantee health care to all people through a Medicare for all single payer program. Next Saturday, next Saturday, I'll be going up to Toronto, Canada, and I'll be touring a number of the hospitals there and speaking to some of their leadership to learn how it can be that in a country 50 miles away from where I live in Burlington, Vermont, they are able to guarantee and provide health care to every man, woman, and child in their country at 50% of the cost per capita that we pay. And as progressives, we understand in our gut that health care is a human right, not a privilege. And we understand that this is the United States of America, our infrastructure. And by that I mean not only our roads and our bridges and our water systems and our wastewater plants, I mean the need to rebuild housing in America because we have a major affordable housing crisis 
from one end of this country to the other. All over this country, you got people making thirty, forty thousand dollars a year. They're spending half of their income to put a roof over their heads and their children's heads. We need and we can create millions of jobs, up to 15 million good-paying jobs, rebuilding our crumbling infrastructure, which means also affordable housing, making sure we have high-quality broadband in every community in America. And I know that I speak right here in a community that has some of the great universities literally not only in our country, but in the world. And you all should be proud of that, but we also understand something else. That in America today, we got hundreds of thousands of bright young people who want to get a higher education, but can't do it for one reason, their families cannot afford it. And we have millions of people, including, I am sure, many in this room right now who are dealing with very high levels of student debt. How many of you are dealing with student debt? All right. Our job then, and this is not a radical proposal, is to say that in a world where economies are changing every day as a result of the explosion of technology, education has got to keep up with that changing technology. And that is why we must make public colleges and universities tuition free. and substantially lower student debt. And we also know that in the wealthiest country in the history of the world, there is something profoundly wrong when we have a criminal justice system which is broken in which we have more people in jail than any other country on earth. We are spending $80 billion a year at the local, state, and federal level locking up Americans, disproportionately African American and Latino and Native Americans. Well, I kind of think that maybe it makes more sense to be investing in our young people in education and jobs rather than jails and incarceration. And at a time when we have 11 million people, overwhelming majority of them honest, hardworking people who are undocumented, our job is not to pick on those people, not to terrify those people, not to suggest to children that their parents are going to be deported. That's not what this country is supposed to be about. What we need is real, comprehensive immigration reform and a path towards citizenship. All right, brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, here is the main point. And that's why you are doing what you're doing and why you have these great candidates up in front of you. We are not a poor country. We are the richest country in the history of the world. We can accomplish anything we want to accomplish if people stand up, think big, and are prepared to take on powerful special interests. That's what it's about. That is what it is about. And all of the ideas, you know, I wish I could tell you that all of the ideas that I'm talking to you about this morning, you know, I thought of them all. These are radical ideas. These ideas exist already in country after country all over the world. We got thousands of kids, American kids, going to Germany now. You know why? Because they can get free college education in Germany. Well, we thank you, Germany but we should be doing it here in the United States of America. We should be leading the world. We should be leading the world in transforming our energy system away from fossil fuel and creating millions of jobs as we move to solar and wind and other sustainable energies. 
We can do these things. And what this system does, they beat people down in a thousand different ways. They tell you, you want to run for city council, don't be ridiculous. What do you know about city council? What do you know about the school board? How dare you think you're smart enough to run for state legislature, United States Senate? Who the hell do you think you are? Only the Koch brothers people have the right to run for those offices. But let me give you a little secret. I work in the United States Senate. I'm going to be on a plane to Washington in a few hours. And if you think you can't get involved in public life, take a look at some of my colleagues in the United States Senate. So our job psychologically is beating down the barriers, beating down the barriers that say, how dare you, a working person, have a dream that you're entitled to health care or to see your kid go to college? How dare you have that dream? What you should be dreaming about is giving the Koch brothers even more in tax breaks. So what we are saying here today is that at every level, and the local level, and I speak as a former four-term mayor of Burlington, the local level more than any other level is a way to involve people in the political process. When I was mayor, we had all kinds of councils, councils involved. What, what should we be doing with our infrastructure? What should we be doing with our waterfront? How do we build affordable housing? How do we open the doors of City Hall to women? How do we have a better relationship with the trade unions in the city? Involve people in the process. Revitalize American democracy. And that's what you're doing today. So brothers and sisters, thank you so much for coming out. Thank you for supporting the great candidates. The political revolution is beginning, and this is what it looks like. Thank you. Don't you know, talking about a